We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Before we start this conversation with uh, Dr. Azim Ibrahim, thank you for being with us. Uh, I want to read this interesting story back from 2022. There was a man, he had a loaded AK-47, and he was apprehended by the FBI just outside the New York home of a journalist. This journalist was named Masi Alinajad. This was moments before he actually planned to storm into her home and probably kill her. This wasn't a normal criminal act by some lone gunman. It was a sinister plot by an Eastern European criminal gang working covertly for the Iranian regime. Mazi had been stalked for eight days by assassins while they carefully surveilled her house, even sending her flowers to attempt to lure her into the street. Chilling videos were captured on her ring doorbell, showing the attackers repeatedly visiting her front porch. And Mazi wasn't a random victim. She was carefully targeted by the Iranian government in what is just one example of transnational repression, which is a term I believe coined by you. Now, if you think the situation is rare, consider there's actually been a lot of assassination attempts that we know of against dissidents on U.S. soil, uh, many of which likely go unsolved. Just this year, it's been revealed that the Chinese Communist Party has operated police stations in big cities like New York City, Los Angeles, Houston, and routinely uses these locations to stalk and harass critics of the Chinese Communist Party. So why have these authoritarian nations become emboldened to launch these types of attacks across the globe, even in countries like ours? Uh, and that's what our guest is here to, to talk about, maybe among a, a, a few other things. Um, again, Dr. Reber, thank you for, uh, for being here. I'll say a little bit about you. You're a research professor at the Strategic Studies Institute, U.S. Army War College, director at the Newsline Institute for Strategy and Policy in Washington, D.C., at your Ph.D. from University of Cambridge, um, author of three books, The Rohingyas, uh, Inside Myanmar, Myanmar's Genocide, Radical Origins, Why Are We Losing the War Against Islamic Extremism?, authoritarian century omens of a post-liberal future and um you've also gotten uh, you're also a reservist in the fourth battalion parachute regiment it's pretty cool uh is that free fall only or is that is, is that free fall or uh, static line it was static yeah, yeah. So i'm not i'm not obligated as a reservist mm. anymore yeah that, that was done a long time ago static yeah. line is yeah. is uh that can be rough mm. that's how your ankles get broken yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's i've seen a lot of that not the fun part of uh of skydiving um, all right. So what, um, you, you, your recent book really kind of examines this, this, uh, as, as you call it, kind of, a, what's, what's wait, well, I've already forgotten the term authoritarian, uh, trans, rep, uh, transnational repression. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, why, why write the book in the, in the first place? Is there just too many examples to ignore? And there was a desire to, to let's examine this. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks so much for having me, Dan, for this, uh, to discuss this very important topic. Yeah, so the, the premise of this book, you know, I've been working on these ideas for the last 10 years or so, and the premise of the book is relatively straightforward. You know, in 1941, there were 11 democracies around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, today, there are over 100. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the majority of these democracies, you realise, are less than 70 years old. So in the grand trajectory of human civilization, democracy is actually a relatively new idea. Yeah. It's an untested idea. And what we have seen over within our lifetime is that democracy is actually in decline and not just in decline from an individual citizen level in yeah. our countries and in the West, but also on a global level. Democracy does not have the same cachet and attractiveness it once had. Now, for example, if you were to take a survey of young people, whether it's in the United States or whether it's in Europe or anywhere else, and ask them, you know, what do they want? What do they aspire to? Most of them will tell you, look, I want to be influential. I want to have my own voice. I want to have a platform. I want to say what I want. And the reality is social media gives them all of that. Now, mm -hmm. If you as a young person, as a teenager in America want to have a voice, you become a TikToker. You become a YouTuber. 
You it is like the Instagram. number one uh, thing young people are saying, apparently, in surveys these days. What do you want to be when you grow up? Like a TikTok influencer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, and okay. very few of them will aspire to any sort of um, uh, democratic mandate, as we would understand it in the traditional sense. You know, young people are not joining political parties. They're not getting involved. You know, they feel that politics has left them behind. So there's a lot of, you know, complacency there from the young people. Does that mean they're anti-democracy though, just because they want to be a TikTok influencer or there's separate questions that show that even in Western civilization, you know, I don't want democracy. I don't know. I'm not sure what the alternative is. They, again, it's like the, it's the least worst mm -hmm. form of government we've tried yeah. so far, <laughs> yeah. you know, as, as I forget yeah. that with the quote, made that quote, but yeah. it was somebody relevant yeah, and Ch famous. Churchill, yeah, yeah. Churchill, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, but what, what's the, yeah. do, do we see well, the, there? The, 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 when I say decline of democracy, in this context, I mean in terms of political parties, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, that is certainly in decline by all measures. And so for young people, democracy and having a voice can be channeled through other avenues through technology and social media. So the traditional political parties that you and I may be familiar with, they're certainly not attractive propositions anymore for a lot of young people. And that's on the individual kind of domestic level. But even if you look internationally, we have a very new phenomena mm -hmm. with the rise of China, with the rise of Russia, yeah. but particularly with the rise of Xi Jinping. You know, he's a very different leader than the other previous kind of leaders. Yeah. And the model that he has developed and the model that he is exporting through the Belt and Road and others is actually very attractive for a lot of countries. Mm -hmm. You know, after the Cold War, you know, I did my PhD thesis on this. Is that the, the thesis was that, you know, all of these countries in the former Soviet states, they're all going to go to war with each other. They're all going to start fighting with each other. And it's going to be a complete mess, you know, when, when they become independent. Uh, but the reality is, is that all of them actually had a very smooth transition because the aspiration for all of them was to actually join the European Union. They wanted mm -hmm. to join the European Union, have access to the European Union markets, have freedom of movement and capital and so on. And uh, so we became complacent. We became complacent yeah. that, look, this is the direction of travel. Countries want to be democratic. They want to join the economic, international economic system and so on. But the reality is that the China has now developed an alternative system, which for many countries is actually much more attractive. Like, for example, if you were the leader of a, a developing country that's where poverty is rife, half mm -hmm. the population lives under the poverty line. You need immediate help. You need immediate help. You, you don't need want long-term, like, hey, look, if you do, in the long term, you're going to be great if you yeah. do these things, but you want immediate help. And so China kind of You need that. immediate help, and you need help without any questions. And here's the Chinese, they come in and say, well, look, you've got this country here, needs a lot of work done. We will, we will build your roads, highway, bridges, infrastructure, airports. We'll build it all. Yeah, we'll do everything for you. And you can take a couple of hundred million dollars for yourself as well on the side. They actually encourage that. And the reason they encourage is that once you take that money, then you are in power for life, you know, because the next guy that comes in is going to come after you for corruption. Yep. So you and your family are now dependent on the Chinese. And obviously the people see the infrastructure being built. You know, they'll see the highways, they'll see the yep. roads, they'll see the airports. Flashy. Yep. It's all flashy stuff. It's physically visible. And so you get credit for this. And no questions asked. You know, they're not asking you to reform your system and enact a, a, a mm -hmm. legislation on trans rights and gay and lesbians or uh, prisoners or anything like that, uh, anything of that nature. They are basically content. And in fact, the, the, the more uh, further you are away from the Western ideal, the better it is because you have become a client state for life. So that model is being exported throughout the whole globe. Yeah. And that's very effective. This is economic colonization. Yeah. by the Chinese. And I don't think that Americans and we in the West have fully realized how attractive this is. And we do not, we've not come up with an appropriate response yet. We talk about it a lot. We haven't come up with an appropriate response. They, uh, it's not lost on us. We're, yeah. we're, we're talk, it gets talked about, but the, the, the th you know, you run into a couple obvious obstacles, which is we're never going to be willing to spend the kind of money the Chinese are willing to spend. It's a, it's a, you know, we, we complain about ourselves printing money. Mm. It, the Chinese printing money, it, that's all. It's a whole new level. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the way I understand it, like the government will, will take loans from banks and then just tell the bank, we don't owe it to you anymore. Yeah. And I don't know how long that financial system uh, lasts, but it's lasting for now. And um, I, I guess there might be other good news, which is my, my, my take is that a lot of these developing countries, they, they know they're getting suckered. Yeah. They're just like, oh, we don't have a choice. And, and, and but but it is getting worse and worse because they realize the Chinese actually import workers. They don't even get to hire their own their own local laborers. And then the stuff falls apart, whether it's the yeah. stadium or the subway or whatever the, the Chinese yeah. built. So but you know, we we do have mechanisms to help that we don't I, we definitely don't use enough yeah. because of just the 
I think some of the sillier debates that, that happen up here, uh, you look at the import export bank and severely underutilized, probably not utilized strategically the way it could be is, is, is feedback that I get from, from, you know, our embassies on the ground. And, um, you know, people should understand like that's not actually spending money. It's, it's, it's making the taxpayer money yeah. because it, it, it gives loans and those loans are paid back with interest. It makes the taxpayer money. Hard to think of a better deal than that. Yeah. Um, and it, yes, it helps companies. And I suppose you could call that a form of corporatism. Okay. I, I, I didn't, I don't like the options yeah. I have all the time, but they are my options. So, you know, take it or leave yeah. it. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And I think you're, you're absolutely correct. There's that countries are waking up to this and they're realizing that, look, these loans are not loans, con conventional kind of loans. And I think a very good case study of this is actually what happened in Sri Lanka. If you remember President mm -hmm. Rajapatska, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, when he was in power, he wanted to build a port, the Hamombata mm -hmm. port. He went to the World Bank, he went to the United States, he went to India. All of them told him that this project is a dud. There's simply no way that this is going to work out. He went to the Chinese and they said that, look, we'll build this for you. Mm -hmm. They built the port. He simply could not keep up the interest payments on the, the, the loan payments. And so what did the Chinese do? Exactly what they planned to do, which is they took over the port on a 99-year mm -hmm. lease. And it's now part of the string of peril strategy you know, in terms of having yeah. bases throughout the country, uh, throughout the region. And so this is essentially what China is doing. And I don't think many U.S policymakers have fully realised that what is going on here. China is building a number of client states, satellite states around the globe that are completely dependent on it. There's been one study done in this, Dan, um, it's by the Kiel Institute of Global Economics in Germany. They examined 100 publicly available contracts, publicly available on the Belt and Road Initiative with countries. What these contracts have, they have a clause within them that says if a country were to change drastically its foreign policy, then those co those loans can be recalled. So mm. if a country decides, or you know, free free the Dalai Lama, or they invite the Dalai Lama, you know, f um, uh, mm -hmm. stand with Hong Kong, recognize Taiwan, or recognize whatever, Taiwan, yeah. those loans will be recalled. So these are all essentially now become Chinese satellite states. You know, yeah. one by one, this is economic colonization. And this is what China is doing. It's a very different model than we have seen in the past, where we had, you know, traditional colonization with militaries and, and, and personnel. This is basically getting all of these countries on board. And, you know, the whole question of Taiwan. It's not soft power. It's not hard power. It's this medium sort of it's power. A medium, yeah. Absolutely. And, and some countries are realizing this. And this is where I think the United States really needs to step up. And I, I'm completely with you. And that, that we have not fully utilized all the levers at our disposal in terms of getting these countries on board. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a question of economic power. The Chinese are just very good at outreach. You know, and I'll give you an example of this. You know, I had a friend of mine who worked in the embassy in uh, one of the Latin American countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they had a big summit, he said the Americans sent one assistant deputy secretary of state with a like, couple of staffers. The Chinese sent 50 delegates, 50. And he said, and even when they visit some of the Arab countries, the Chinese officials, they speak fluent Arabic. They would recite ancient Arabic poetry. They'll quote the Quran I've to heard you. this in certain places too. Yeah, They've got a lot better at diplomacy, whereas before they were the awkward kid in the they corner. They were the awkward ones, absolutely. Yeah. But they have the old Soviet model in which they specialize very early and you stick to that field. Whereas yeah. we have this model, what they call transferable skills. You, you know, you can transfer, you, you learn a certain mm -hmm. skill, you kind of go the year, you're in Latin yeah. America one day, you're in Iraq the next day, then right. you're doing something. And whereas they, you specialize once and, and then and that's it. And, and, and the countries appreciate that, you know, they, they come there and right. they kind of speak the language and they speak exactly and they'll never make any demands of you and so we really need to step up our game so it's not just economic power it's also about diplomacy and outreach and uh, many of these countries feel neglected you know where is the united states where is the u.s in africa where is the u.s in latin america and this is where we really need to up our game particularly when countries themselves are realizing that look the chinese thing the whole chinese uh, model is not what was what was kind of sold right. to us particularly in latin america is, is, is certainly my focus on the intelligence committee mm -hmm. and um it, it's it's because it's our own backyard africa's africa but the, the latin america you, you cannot let that happen um we want to go back to the psychology of mm -hmm. of democracy diminishing uh, i thought it was it's kind of an interesting conversation because as you were talking about that i was thinking i i, I sort of get it um how the how human nature works um if you look at a, a hierarchy of needs, I think safety and security is the primary, yeah. you know, not, you know, how, can I start my own business without going yeah. through a bunch of regulations and taxes? Like that becomes important, mm -hmm. but 
it's you can't even start thinking about that until you are safe and secure and sheltered. Yeah. And so it's not surprising mm-hmm. that, um, and, and it, you know, democracy is new and humans aren't used to it. Uh, humans have always lived mm-hmm. in some kind of, you know, in the beginning of some kind of tribal hierarchy followed by just bigger hierarchies, yeah. but always under immense control. Um, in China, like they, 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 they don't understand what we're even mm-hmm. talking about. Like, well, why wouldn't you enforce that? Well, yeah. they shouldn't be saying that. Yeah, <laughs> and it's yeah, like, yeah. but they can say whatever they want. Yeah, yeah. Like that's how we, hello, even in Britain, yeah. um, you know, it's in America is a very kind of a unique place in this regard. Um, and, and so it's, yeah, that value system isn't there. We can't take it for granted. I, I've, you know, even, even in modern times, you have some interesting conversations with a Russian or I, this is a long time ago, but not that long ago in the last 10 years when um, you could visit Russia and I visited St. Petersburg and our tour guide for the day, she was, um, you know, a Russian woman, maybe almost 60. So it's a very clear memories of the Soviet era and uh, her, uh, that conversation was uh, fascinating. I mean, she just, she believes we're the ones who are, yeah. who are, who are uh, oppressed by propaganda. Yeah, yeah. She like, and I'm like, what? And she's like, no, I mean, the Soviet union was, was great. Cause like, you know, you, you could kind of be whatever you mm-hmm. wanted. And I'm like, I don't think that's true, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's a, I think, I, I think they give you maybe like three choices that you get to pick or, yeah. and, 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 but her other point was, which was more honest, we're all in it together. Yeah. We're all at the same level. Like there was more community, you know, there wasn't, you didn't have to worry or think about, you know, your next plan. Yeah. But I'm like, well, that's the, kind of the beauty of freedom. Yeah. It's it's a challenge. I didn't say it was easy. Yeah. It's a challenge. And like in America, the whole mm-hmm. point is like embrace the challenge mm-hmm. of freedom. But that's a totally different mindset. That's a unique mindset. Um, you know, I, I, you go to a school mm-hmm. uh, and it has a uniform policy. You know, that, that becomes like an easier thing to do yeah, every yeah. day in a, in a sense to have a uniform policy because then you're not worried about like, God, am I in style? Yeah. Are people going to make fun of me? No, I'm wearing a uniform. It's yeah. easy. Um, when I come to Congress, I mm-hmm. wear a uniform. It's a suit. I don't have to yeah. think about it. Some people wear patterns. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't pattern. Mm-hmm. Don't pattern. You're <laughs> patterning a little bit right yeah. now. Yeah. You look good. That's on you. I, I can't do that too much. Yeah. It's too much for me, yeah. you know, too and I've already got on a flare with the eye yeah. patch. I don't yeah. need a pattern, <laughs> but, uh, you know, yeah. so, so I get the human. I wonder if that's yeah. a part of it, you yeah. know, that you, you constantly have to recognize that psychology. Yeah, so, so it's, there's certainly a part of conformity. People want to conform. They want to believe in order. They want to have that kind of security. And, and you're absolutely right. The number one priority for almost everybody, you know, is to have security for themselves and for their family. You know, there's absolutely nothing more important than that. That comes well before any kind of economic opportunity or any other, you know, ideological kind of factors. But what I would say about the your friend from the Soviet Union is that, you know, many of them may say that, but the reality is, is that none of them actually believed it. You know, even um, uh, if you read uh, Gorbachev's bi- auto- uh, biography by the brilliant academic... They didn't William believe Trump, it at the time. They didn't believe it at the time. They look, yeah, t- they look yeah, back yeah. on it now and they're like... We're Russian. Don't tell us what we yeah. were wrong about. And I, yeah, yeah, it's like an well, act. nostalgia is obviously uh, 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 and is, uh, is always um, uh, re-engineered to fit mm-hmm. your current worldview. Yeah, um, uh, and we see this all the time. People want to go back to the twenties and thirties, family values and so on. But it was a different yeah. era of time. This wasn't. Yeah. Like, so you want no indoor plumbing. You <laughs> want no iPhone. Yeah. Like what? Well, like yeah, you know, yeah, you yeah, think about where you're going yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not. It wasn't easy yeah. back then. It wasn't easy at all. You know, and if you read uh, uh, Gorbachev's biography, you know, he said that people wanted to rise up in the Communist Party simply so that they could travel overseas. They would have a license to travel overseas so they can buy soap and shampoo. Remember the the first episode of The Americans? I need to get through that whole series Mm -hmm. because I heard it's pretty good. Um, And it was good episodes I watched. But like the first episode is about them like questioning their role. Yeah. And, uh, and he's, and the, and the, the husband in the show is like, I don't know, like, what is so bad about this yeah, place? Yeah, yeah. Like all the food in the grocery yeah. store, like taking our kids to school, like yeah. what is so bad? Yeah. You know? And, uh, I was like, it was interesting, like watching them kind of yeah. struggle through that. Um, but then they became terrible spies. And yeah. So. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> and, and it's absolutely true. But see, even with the Chinese, what I would say the silver lining in all of this is that even the Chinese leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, the Politburo, and they have a much stronger belief in their system than the Soviets ever did. But mm. even with them, you know, you look at every member of the Politburo, the reality is, is that, uh, you know, every single one of them likes to make their money in China, but they like to invest it and keep it overseas. Oh, massive in capital the US. flight. The number one ambition of every single member of the Politburo of the Communist Party, all the elite in, in, in China, is to send their children to an Ivy League school or to Oxford and Cambridge. And that's the reality. 
And so, because they know is that their system, deep down, whether they admit it or no, they know their system is rotten. Yeah. yeah, they know you fall foul of Xi Jinping. No matter who you are, you basically you're going to disappear overnight. That's so why they're so sensitive about people who dissent and yeah. say bad things about. Because the system is fragile. They know the system is fragile. They do, do not tolerate any sort of um, uh, you know conversations against them. You know, look what happened to Bo Xi Lai, Jack Ma, Desmond Chum. Jack Ma was the biggest entrepreneur yeah. in China, and he was actually very pro Communist Party. But the fact is, not he enough. Just, he, he, yeah, but the fact that he just got too successful, and you cannot be that successful and not yeah, be... Yeah, that's a be- wild story. Look, can, we, can you um, remind viewers, listeners, mm. what, who exactly he was and what Jack happened? Jack Ma was the richest man in China. He was, yeah. a, he was a very, very brilliant entrepreneur. Like hundreds of billions of hundreds dollars Hundreds of billions worth, of yeah. dollars, yeah. Um, uh, all, he, he founded Alibaba, uh, the yeah, biggest yeah. online like the, portal the, in the world. The Google equivalent. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge, massive and uh, but the reality, and even when he came to the West, he would come to these think tanks in Washington and he'd be very pro-communist party, very mm-hmm. pro-Chinese uh, Chinese government, but he said a couple of things about regulation and, and that was it. And regulation? Were, he said there's too much regulation in China and, and that was it. The guy disappeared. He disappeared for months and he, end, you know, he reappeared after a few months, but half of his assets were stripped. And look what happened to the recent defense minister in China. Do we ever, are we ever going to know where he was? He won't we say. We have no idea. No he idea. won't say. He he's like, he's say. like, I was, uh, I was sick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, well, they, they, they know the repercussions the for you and your family and everybody else, yeah. you know, and they know how to keep people in line. So I think that's the silver lining is that even they know deep down inside, no matter what they say, you know, the wolf warrior diplomacy about how bad the West is and everything else, that their own system is corrupt. And in fact, recently I was reading, Dan, about uh, these six TV anchors in China, um, uh, all of them were ra- rabidly anti American. Six of them, after they retired, five of them retired in California. You know, because they know this is where freedom is. This is where mm-hmm. no matter what, I may commit a crime, but they're not going to pick up my kids. You know, they're mm-hmm. not going to seize my assets and seize my kids and kick them out of school. And yeah. in China, they'll do that. And so they know their system is rotten. Yeah, and it, the difference between mm-hmm. somewhere like China and North Korea versus say, Iran mm-hmm. or Venezuela. Iran and Venezuela have mm-hmm. an undercurrent of a yeah. culture that's like, no, I actually do want to be free. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I see no indication of that in China. So I've never been, don't tell me yeah. wrong. And North Korea definitely doesn't have that. Um, well, the Ch- China, you know, at the moment, people, well, first of all, we will never know. Yeah, They're, they they very effectively control all information. And this is something I, I think that we, once again, completely misjudged. If you remember when Bill Clinton was in discussions to let China into the World Trade Organization, you know, he said, well, China's trying to censor the internet. That's like nailing jello on the wall. Ha, ha, ha. And everybody laughed. But the reality is, they did censor the internet and they're still doing it with the Great Firewall yep. very effectively. Yeah. And they've essentially, they control all the information. So we'll never know what the people were, what people are actually thinking. The second thing is, is that, you know, as long as the Chinese Communist Party is creating jobs yeah, and creating economic kind of, uh, is moving in the right direction, people will be con- happy. But once that stops, that is when people start questioning the system. So they are basically on a race against time. Uh, mm. to arrest any sort of economic decline. And the third point I would make is that, you know, this has been one of the most unfortunate kind of things that we did not anticipate coming, is that when we let China into the World Trade Organization and into international organizations, we anticipated that, look, once they join our system, you know, they'll become more like us, you know, they'll open up, or more free, democratic, and so on. Mm-hmm. But in fact, if you look at the evidence, Dan, the precise opposite has happened. China is exporting its values to the West, they, mm. We are conforming our institutions according to them. And yeah. if you don't believe me, you know, look what yeah. happened to Hollywood, like, MBA, you know. Um, yeah, the, 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 the Houston Rockets coach, one tweet, you know, stand yeah. with Hong Kong, that was a $260 million contract cancelled. The CEO of Cathay Pacific, the, you know, any corporation, that you're a member of Congress, so you have a lot more leeway. But if you're like, for example, a lawyer in a, in a law firm or, or, or the CEO in a, in a public corporation yeah. that's got any interest in China, you know, yep. one tweet, you know, free to bet. You're done. Yeah. So everybody is conforming their institutions. That's the opposite have happened. That's a good point. You know, yeah. we are based, they're exporting their values to us. And the best example of this I can give you is, is Hollywood, yeah. the largest, That's most terrible. influential cultural institution in the world. Not in Tom world. Cruise. 
and not Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise yeah. wouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah, and and, and and a lot and a lot of the other ones as as well refused, you know, to conform. To Quentin Tarantino mm-hmm. refused to completely conform to this. But the reality is, look, China, uh, Hollywood produced two movies in 1997 on on China that were negative movies, and uh, and even at that time. The market, China was 10% the size of the United States. Yeah. And even then, China cancelled these Hollywood actors, they cancelled the movies and etc. Yeah. And then since that time, not a single Chinese, a critical movie of China has been produced because this is the largest market. And what, the biggest culprit of all of this is actually Disney. Mm-hmm. Now you think about Disney, the wholesome kind of pic, the wholesome messages and the images that they always give, mm-hmm. you know, there's always a moral story behind it all. But they are actually the biggest culprits in all of this. You know, they edit their movies to make sure Taiwan's not shown, they edit the flags, they change the language, and all just so they can have access to the Chinese market. Yeah. So in many respects, they're exporting their values to us. We are adapting our way of life. You know, it's very different for a member of Congress or an academic, but anybody else, you know, that has any kind of public profile, Houston yeah. Rockets, football team, or anyone yeah. at Hollywood, you're basically, you're, you're done. You have to conform. And so this, this is astonishing. This is an astonishing situation. Yeah, it's 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 uh, very un-American too, to give, to give in like that. Um, well, let's talk about the the Chinese police stations. Yeah. You know, let's uh, visualize that for people. We, we I think most have heard about the, the police stations discovered around the country. Yeah. What are they for? What do they actually look like? What do they do? Well, these police stations are essentially, they're all over the world. And uh, they were only picked them up recently, and that was only because of a private investigator. The reality is that, you know, our security agencies, whether it's the FBI or others, kind of dropped the ball. They didn't really know what's happening. So this is another form of transnational repression, which I was referring to. You know, transnational repression is a... a, is a mechanism to target citizens of, of your own country and others to make sure that they basically um, uh, they conform their behaviour. You know, in the past, like 20 years ago, if you escaped from North Korea, you escaped from Iran, you came to America, you came to Belgium, you, you're basically safe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is a mechanism that, that has been accelerated to target dissidents, to give them, to make sure that they're aware that you you never be safe. You'll never be safe. And it comes in many forms. So each of the individual acts of transnational repression are, you know, in them by themselves, they could be criminal acts, you know, digital intimidation, blackmailing, uh, kidnapping your members of your family back home, freezing your assets. So each of them individually, but as a conceptual framework, we're only now getting around to exactly what it is. Um, so in Canada, you see no, the, in the Indians assassinated one of the Sikh dissidents as a form of transnational oppression, uh, targeting members of the, uh, you know, the opposition overseas, you know, and, and, it's, and it's very sophisticated, you know, digital intimidation, uh, you know, you put out rumours against people or, you know, so-and-so congressman, so-and-so did not pay his taxes for two years and it's an online thingy and then you're trying to fight against it. It's different if you're a public figure, but if you're, a, if you're basically a, a dissident, yeah, it's got no assets, just come, you know, there's nothing you can really do. It's, it's real, it's a, it's a real challenge. And so what's happening is essentially these police stations that the CCP were setting up was for this specific purpose, it was to target dissidents and people that were critical of the of, of the regime in China. So once again, it re-emphasizes that look, they, they know themselves the system is really fragile and they have to control the narrative. And it's only now that we're kind of picking up that what exactly is happening. And it's the most unfortunate because this goes against everything that the Westphalian system created is that, look, countries are sovereign and to interfere in the internal affairs of another country in this kind of fashion is, is completely illegitimate. But the CCP have been doing this very effectively. How do you think, so, so what does it look like? Is it like, uh, it's not, it doesn't look like a police station. It's just like a, behind a launder, or like a laundry. Yeah. Or like a, something or whatever. Basically, they're hiding behind, you know, legitimate institutions like tourism and, yeah. uh, you know, educational and so on. But these were actually specifically trained officers to come and mm-hmm. investigate uh, Chinese citizens um, uh, in the United States and elsewhere. It's hard to, I guess, uh, vet you know, a, a Chinese national coming in on a visa um, and, and know that they're part of this group in a clandestine way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I wonder if there's anything we can do to, to improve that process. But Yeah. Well, the, the system has improved a lot. You know, what happened in the past, Dan, was, was the most unfortunate is that we had lots of Chinese coming in and they're members of the military, openly members of the PLA, yeah. you know, people. And they'd come in specifically to steal information. 
to yeah. still research and they'd get access to PhDs at MIT and you know, right. Nottingham University in the UK and etc. And they'd come and they would actually be instructed and there's an entire division in the PLA sp- for this specific uh-huh. purpose. And they're basically told that as soon as you get in, download your supervisor's database right. and they send it back uh, to China. And so in many respects, I would say that, and this was described by General Keith Alexander, you know, the director of the National Security C- uh, Council, as the largest theft in human history. They were stealing $350 billion worth of IP, intellectual property from the United States every single year. And so we have tightened that up a little bit. But in, in, in many ways, you know, it's very difficult for even the Chinese citizens because they get immense pressure put on them. And I'll give you a very quick story, uh, Dania. So I was invited just earlier this year, I was invited to Boston um, uh, to come and speak to the board of directors of one of the largest oil companies in the world. Yeah, so they wanted to know about global trends, where they're going, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the directors are kind of up to speed. And I gave my full kind of presentation. After, and they had, a, they had about eight people from Shanghai there. And, um, uh, and after my presentation, one of them stood up and said that, uh, look, everything you're saying is totally lies. Yeah, mm-hmm. It's all lies. There's none of this happening. China's a great country. It's a great friend. You know, we want peace, etc. As soon as she stood up, there was a whole line of people behind her. All the Chinese people, uh, Shanghai people stood up, all to say the same thing. And my presentation was stopped by the organiser saying, well, look, we need everyone to cool down, etc. So I took two things away from this. First of all, that is an example of them exporting their values. I could not speak freely. Yeah. I, I was shut down. One of the biggest oil companies in the world. The second thing is that even the organiser told me that, look, that this information is going to go back to the con- Chinese consulate in Boston. And all of these people will be questioned. You had an academic come into town and speak negatively about the Chinese Communist Party. And what did you do? So they all have to stand up and perform. And the stronger performance is, the better it is for them. Otherwise, they'll say, well, look, you just sat there and did nothing. Wow. You know, and th- yeah. so they'll get into trouble. And this is what they want. is that they ha- you, have, ha- you have to not just have loyalty to the regime. You must show it constantly. And this is all a part, form of transnational repression. You have to continuously perform loyalty to to the regime and make sure everybody sees it. Yeah, that's yeah, that's wild. Um, you know, we had a, a consulate in Houston that was was closed down by the FBI. It was it was a it was basically a yeah a, a hub for spying on yeah. intellectual property uh, locally. You know, yeah. um, I mean, how do you explain you know, a lot of these dictators are, are voted in? Yeah, I mean. I guess we kind of talked about the psychology of voting in the strong man, but, but still it's like you, you, you know that they perpetuate a police state. Yeah. Um, you can't not know that. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, this, th- this is a new phenomenon. You know, many of them are coming, being voted in and they're undermining the same democratic edifice that got them into power in the first place. And they usually get voted in by simplistic kind of solutions to very complex problems. And the, most of these, you know, solutions are targeted at external actors or internal minority groups. Mm. You know, all of your problems are here because of the yeah. Uyghurs. All of your problems are because of this minority group's causing, you know, stealing your jobs, they're stealing the money, is corruption, etc. Or this is all done because of the CIA's, the CIA's kind of... And mm. so they come into it's power through one. these kind of... <laughs> yeah, they, they come into power by these kind of vehicles and they undermine the same kind of edifice. And, and we, we, we've seen this across the globe. And, th- and this is mostly... Uh, it's a most unfortunate situation. You know, one of the questions I get asked often is that, look, democracy comes in many forms. You know, what's your actual definition of democracy and it's true you know the freedom house has the ranking of democracy and they have different kinds of democracy so for example they're referring to india now as a managed democracy because it's become much less democratic than it was in the past yeah that's a good that's a good kind of question to have actually is you know we we, we, we have the debate here we are a republic or democracy and it's like well we're a or a Republican democracy, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what I, what I would say is that, look, democracy does come in many different forms and there's different aspects of democracy, you know, and there's so many different uh, facets to it. But I would say at the heart of, in my opinion, at the heart of everything is accountability. Mm-hmm. If those in power can be held accountable, then it's a functioning uh, democracy. Mm. If that is not there, you know, those in powers are never held accountable and kind of get away with a lot of stuff, then that is not a functioning democracy. So you, so you can have elections, sense. you can have free press, you can, but if you're not held to account, so I, I and this is just my personal perspective, I think accountability yeah. is the absolute key and foundation. And, I, and I'll tell you an, another story which which, is, which which was stuck with me for quite some time. You know, I'm, uh, it was about Richard Nixon's, um, uh, one of his advisors, and uh, he was saying when Nixon resigned office. He said, I took my two daughters 
I put them in the back of my car. And he said, and I drove to the White House and I told them, I said, see that man over there? That is the President of the United States. He is the most powerful man in the world. And today, he is being forced to resign that office. And nowhere will you see anybody with a gun. Nowhere will you see anybody forcing him out. He is mm. being forced to resign because of the rule of law. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. That, the the, the good, good definition of a, of a democracy yeah, is accountability that, of those elected that officials. That, to me, is, is, is the, the entire um, uh, story and philosophy of, right. of the United States. Look, yeah, that's how, it's how we're design. founded. The rule of law is above the, the king. The rule of law. You know, this is the president of the United States. He's the most powerful. He was forced to resign because the yeah. law the law said he had to go. But his own he government in, uh, in, in, in both this administration yeah. and the last administration can investigate that. Yeah, him, absolutely. And like, yeah. yeah, and in China, like, they, they can't comprehend that. They're yeah. like, well, why would you do that? Yeah. He's our leader. The, the, <laughs> you the, can't. The, the Chinese cannot comprehend that. I remember um, um, Governor Chris Patton, who was the last governor of Hong Kong, uh, the British governor, before it was handed over to the Chinese. And he, and he said in one of his speeches, he said, I would meet with my Chinese counterparts. And at that time, he was also agriculture. He was agriculture minister. And uh, he said that, look, uh, he's got a number of court cases going on in the UK against these farmers. And mm. there's a possibility that the farmers may win and he'd have to go back to the UK and, you know, and, and, and deal with it. And to them, this was completely mind-boggling that a government minister could be taken to court by a, a member of the public, a farmer, and the <laughs> farmer may win. <laughs> you know, they just could not get their head around. Yeah. You know? And what he said was very good. He said, look, in China, he said, we have the, he said, you may have the, you have the rule by law. We have the rule of law. Mm -hmm. Very different. You have the rule by law. Yeah. You have the rule of law. You, you know, gotta make up the laws they go they to. Basically, they use the law to enforce their dictates. Yeah. You know, and, and that's how it is. What's uh What's the incentives of you know, this sort of string of authoritarian regimes around the world? Uh, I, th I think there's many in the United States who naively believe that you know we, we can just uh, separate ourselves from all these problems. We can just separate ourselves from global supply chains. It's mm. getting too crazy. Why are we spending money abroad? Why are we mm. leading abroad? It annoys people. Um, and so there's 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 that. We I, I battle that uh, philosophy constantly, yeah. whether it's libertarian isolationism or on the left. I you know yeah, it's isolationism, but it's more of like a we suck at everything. Yeah. Americans fault, uh, fault for everything. It's that, it's that sort of mentality. And, and honestly that, that right and left, that mentality is yeah. the same. They, they both sound the same to me at this point. Um, so, so there's people who don't believe that, that this is happening, but, but it is. And, and mm. what is it? Um, what I mean by that is this, this sort of coalition, mm. and I don't want to use terms like access of evil, yeah, yeah. you know, it's very loaded terms, but mm. it's, it is a coalition of kind of these like-minded authoritarians. Yeah. And like-minded in what? Mm -hmm. I guess the idea that you should have control over your people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, so that's the, the string that, the, 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 mm -hmm. the thread that strings them all together. And I'm, I'm always trying to think like, what, what is their incentive to, to battle? Like, why, why do they care yeah. if there's democracies? And I guess because they don't want their people to see that there's an alternative. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, that's a very good question, and there's a number of responses to that. First of all, I think this idea of the United States kind of being isolated and not getting involved overseas is probably one of the most dangerous ideas that I've ever developed. Yeah. And the reality is, is that nature abhors a vacuum. Areas that the United States has vacated has been filled in by the Chinese and by Putin, mm -hmm. etc. And so what I would say to that is that, uh, you know, what we've seen, what I described in my book, is exactly yeah. as, you, as you said, it's, it's an alliance of autocracies that is emerging. Like 20 years ago, Dan, you know, if you were a, if you were a dictator, you were an international pariah. You could not travel overseas. You could not basically have the same uh, cachet in international circles in, you know, COP26 or Doha, whatever, you know, um, if you're Gaddafi or Saddam or any, or the Khomeini or anybody like that. But now we have a new situation in which autocracies are coming together and forming an alliance. And it's an informal alliance, but they're all kind of helping each other. So they're all mm -hmm. coming out the shadows. And if you remember the last meeting... It's like, it's like anti-establishment. Anti you know? I mean, it's basically anti-West. It's to the place yeah the United States as a global power so they can manipulate the international rules-based order. And if you remember the last meeting Xi Jinping had when he went to Moscow, the last thing he said to Putin, it was caught on camera, he said, you and I are going to change the world. We're going to be doing this together. 
And yeah. Putin said, yes, absolutely. So what does he mean by this? So in, in, in my book, I describe this as, the term I give it is multilateral autocratization. Institutions, multilateral institutions that we set up in the West after the Second World War are now all being taken over by the likes of China. Mm-hmm. And so they can manipulate them and re-engineer them to serve their interests. To, to give the example of the United Nations, you know, China now controls four of the 11 major UN agencies. No country has ever controlled more than one. Yeah. And the reality is they're, being, they're getting access to these institutions and completely manipulating them. The World Trade Organization, the World Aviation Organization, they've all become cheerleaders from China. And they've right. done this so effectively. The WHO, the World Health Organization, obviously World took Health a lot Organization, of heat. World Health Organization, you know, basically pushing out their talking points for for COVID, etc. And so this is a phenomenon that's going on and the US has basically taken its eye off the ball. And we've vacated the, a lot of these areas. And in fact, the, the chair of the Belt and Road Initiative actually said that, look, this is not entryism by China. You vacated this area and we stepped in. This is not something that you can blame us for. And he's absolutely correct. We need to step up our game and basically um, um, re- you know, re-enter this game. And one other thing I would say... It's a daunting say, task. You need our allies to do it too. We need our allies. We need everybody on board. But what I would like to see, in fact, is that, you know, I would like to see a, an equivalent alliance of democracies. Because I, I firmly believe the international system is no longer functioning as mm-hmm. it should. Uh, yeah. It's been not only taken over by the likes of China. Look, look at the UN Human Rights Council. Who's on the, the world's premium body of human rights? Mm-hmm. Who's on it? <laughs> yeah, You've got a, Saudi, a China, joke, yeah. Cuba, Venezuela, in North Korea. It, it's, yeah. it's absolutely absurd. Yeah, absolutely yeah. absurd. It's, it you really know? is. <laughs> and so what we need to have is an alliance of democracies working together you know, yeah. to kind of push back uh, on this. Because, you know, the system's just not working anymore. No, it's um, yeah, it is a little frightening, and a lot's changed in the last in the last ten years. Some of that, I guess, was inevitable. Um, you know, the, the relative power is going to change yeah. inevitably, uh, and we could still be on top in, in many ways. But th- th- this was this was always something we needed to to plan for. And you know, while, while we keep you know our military mm-hmm. spending up at you know yeah. record amounts, our allies don't, and. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has at least kicked kickstarts some of that. Yeah. You know, I still not nearly enough. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I do. When we go to Europe, we bring this up a lot, and um, it's it's still not even close to clear to me that that any of these countries really take a, a serious defense seriously, yeah. <laughs> serious defense seriously. Yeah. Um, that 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 could replicate American capabilities in the yeah. Europe, just in the European theater. Um. That, that's like a, an enormous problem and, and sense of complacency. It's, it's, a, it's a huge issue, you know, and, and, and you're absolutely right to bring up the European question because that Europe really needs to kind of step up its game. You know, the only reason Putin was empowered, in fact, was because of Europe, and that's the reality. Yeah. You know, he was able to um, uh, sell his oil to the lakes of Germany, mm. decommissioned all the nuclear power plants and built yeah. these oil pipelines. And they were talking about rebuilding their military, and now they're not. I, yeah. I mean, they're just the worst. They, 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 they abs- most of these European countries have, have been really kind of bad allies in this and not standing with the, yeah. with the United States. I even States. asked a, a British um, guy in their defense ministry in a recent meeting there, and I was blown away by that answer. It was kind of a milly mouth, like he didn't really know how to answer it. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I, I can't remember what my question was exactly, but it was along the lines of, okay, you know, in 50 years, what do you hope your capabilities are? And, you know, in, in, in order to kind of replace mm-hmm. the U S as yeah. your security umbrella. And it just didn't give me an answer. Yeah. I'm like, so you haven't thought about this. Yeah, so yeah. And that's crazy to me that you haven't thought about this. I mean, you're Britain, you're the, you're, yeah. you're the former greatest empire of the world. Yeah. Um, you, you have to think about yeah. this, or at least, and if it's not in these giant conventional mm-hmm. expensive weapons, at least be thinking about what else you can bring to the fight yeah. in, in the form of kind of asymmetric warfare. Asymmetric warfare. Whatever, you know, just do something. Cyber, satellite, yeah. whatever it may be, absolutely. And, uh, yeah. and so this is, the, it, it frustrates Americans and it, it makes mm-hmm. it also harder for us to, to kind of, to take on these battles yeah. ourselves. Because on the one hand, we know we need to, mm-hmm. and, but on the other hand, a lot of citizens have like good questions to ask, yeah. like, well, why can't we just focus on our problems yeah. and why, why aren't our friends helping mm-hmm. enough? And, and, you know, and the answers to both of those are complicated. Um, I liked, I like what you wrote here. I've been meaning to, to read it. Cause you know, you talk about you know, what, what's the point, what is the point? Like why, why, why should we be leaders? And um, this is, this is something I, I, I say a lot too um, as, as helping explain to people why we care, whether it's about Russia invading Ukraine or Venezuela potentially invading Guyana. 
um, Iran meddling in the Middle East. Why do we care? What, China inviting yeah. Taiwan. Why do we care? And he's like, either we allow the international system to once again lapse into a state of complete anarchy, a state in which nations engage in a continuous war of all against all between empires and spheres of influence with the notions of universal human rights, international law falling by the wayside, or we regroup and rebuild the post-war liberal international order, which has enabled the most dramatic advancements in the human condition and our species in our history as a species. I say that too, but like the, these words have mm. like loaded meanings to some, especially on the right, like inter- you want a liberal international order, mm-hmm. it's globalism. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that's, I don't know what you think that is. Yeah. It just means we control shit. Like yeah, that, yeah. that's what it means, yeah. bro. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, and, and by the way, like everything you have mm. is because of that. Absolutely. It's because the U S Navy yeah. says people can trade and, yeah. and you can't take over their ships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that was unheard of yeah. prior to World War II. Yeah. And I'm like, you never experienced life before World War yeah. II. It wasn't good. Yeah. It was, it was, it was anarchy um, for thousands of years. That's always, yeah. that's human existence. Yeah. And I, then nobody has a, not nobody, but, but there's a, just too many in the general public that don't have a great appreciation yeah. of that. So I, I try to hammer that point home as yeah. much as I can. Yeah. Well, th- this is, this is a challenge, Dan, because, you know, we have grown up in all our lifetimes, you know, all we have known in our lifetime is that democracies were the freest, and the wealthiest countries in the world. You know, but the fact is, is that, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the alternative models are emerging. And the reality is, is that Xi Jinping in particular is a very different kind of leader than the mm-hmm. previous ones. So Ho Jintao, Zhang Zemin, they were off the belief that, look, China is destined to be the global superpower and we just have to bide our time. Xi Jinping is very different. He's of the belief that China must assert itself on yeah. the global stage. And the reality is, is that country, the wealthiest country, the most powerful country in the world, is the one that usually kind of dictates the terms, that writes the rules of the game. You know, China is investing very heavily in the next generation of technology, you know, AI, machine learning, quantum computing. If they dominate this area, make no mistake, it's going to be, AI is going to be weaved through every single aspect of our lives, from healthcare to, you know, um, uh, the economy, trade, and whoever dominates that area, the next generation of corporations are all going to come from that. You know, yeah. so it'll be a pay-to-play system. You'll have to subscribe to their values if the next generation of IBM, Cisco's, Google's, you know, everything comes from China. So we ha- th- this is an, a battle for our system. You know, we and we've never experienced this, so we're kind of complacent. But this is right. a battle to protect our way of life. Right now, we're dependent on them for like, honestly, yeah, cheap stuff. Uh, yeah. you know, they're, they're the ones who do all that kind of m- that, that mid middleman processing, yeah, yeah. let's say, whether it's about, whether it's critical mineral processing, you know, the, the, but the, cause they don't mm. own the resources. Yeah. They have to import the resources, but they'll go through, mm. they'll do the dirty work of mm. processing it, making it into a solar panel, making it into a plastic cup Yeah, that, you know, you, you can't really buy plastic molded things yeah. in the United States. Like you can't. But, but this, can't is part of the, this is part of the strategy. But all the plastic pellets come from us. Yeah. Like the, the polymer resins come from Houston. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they e, 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 to China. E, e, even the batteries, you know, in terms of the, 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 the way it's kind of uh, manufactured. But this is part of the strategy. All, all of this is, is public, that every country must be reliant on China. China must be reliant on no country. You know, mm-hmm. they, they dominate these areas and their policy of replicate and replace you, know, yeah. you mentioned solar panels, the biggest solar company in the world, Solar World. They basically just copied their whole technology and yeah. subsidize it, replicate and replace so we d- dominate this area. Electric yeah. vehicles or solar panels, whatever it is, this is part of their strategy. And one final point I would make, I think is very important in terms of their strategy in building these client states. You know, there's a lot of discussion, particularly in this house, about the invasion of Taiwan. When will mm-hmm. that come? You know, China attack. But the reality is, you know, I, I you know, I don't think China is ever going to attack Taiwan. And the the reason why, if you let, uh, I'll explain to you, is that you know China is building all of these satellite states, these these states that are basically completely reliant on it. What they will do in a decade or so is that they'll weaponize all of this. They'll be an, they'll use these countries as an economic blockade for Taiwan. Stop trading. Taiwan has eleven days of fuel, and then before it basically starts shutting down, mm-hmm. eleven days. You have an economic blockade. Countries will do exactly as they're told, and then there'll be internal strife within Taiwan. And to, the voices that want a deal with Beijing, like the KMT party, those voices will be elevated. There'll be riots. People will die. You know, and then the China will step in and say, "Look, we cannot have this chaos. Yeah, mm-hmm. we need to basically stop this." And the model for this is Hong Kong. Yeah. If you remember, everybody in Hong Kong was they were thinking, "Oh, when are the tanks coming? When are the CCP troops coming? Mm-hmm. When is there going to be another Tiananmen Square?" Nothing happened. They took over Hong Kong. Nobody batted an eyelid. 
they'll basically do the same thing with Taiwan. There'll be economic blockade, shut everything down. Voices that say, look, we need to have a deal with Beijing. Beijing will step in and say, look, we need to have sort this out. They'll come in and sort it out and it'll, everything will go back to normal. The entire global will breathe, breathe a sigh of relief to say, well, oh, thank God we've avoided war between the US and China. But then obviously everything will then be controlled by Beijing. And it will look normal from the outside, it will controlled by Beijing, and all the voices that spoke out against Beijing will be quietly disappeared. But nobody will care about them because at least we avoided war. Mm. At least we avoided war. So this is a much... If I was advising Xi Jinping, this is exactly what I would say. Why attack the castle head-on when you can go through the sewer system? You can get everything that you want yeah, by this strategy. Yeah. Yeah, without, I, on most of the United States going to do, it's an economic blockade. Yeah, no, Nobody's been killed, no... PLA troops anywhere with the US really going to go to war with China when the, you know we, we're getting fatigue about Ukraine at the moment and Ukraine is such a clear cut case in the heart of Europe you yeah. know people in America don't even know what Taiwan is is it an independent country is it one China policy where is it you know why we're going to go and, and this is a peer competitor mm-hmm. their navy is larger than ours now this is a peer competitor and so are we really going to go to war when not a single person has been killed They'll achieve everything they want through this economic coercion and blockade, exactly as they did with Hong Kong. And the power is only going to increase without them firing a single well, shot. Well, what do they want, though? Do, do, do they want the economic benefits of, of having Taiwan and its chip manufacturing? Or, but it's deeper than that. I mean, they, I think, I think it's, it's like there's like a historic. There's an emotional, belief. there's an emotional kind of uh, um, uh, 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 dimension to this as well. But obviously, the chip manufacturing. Once again, this is uh, uh, this is poor planning from our side in terms of building our own strategic um, uh, the, the strategic um, resources. Uh, you know, all of our chips are being manufactured in Taiwan. What if there is a blockade? What's going to happen? You know, what, what exactly we're going to do? So th- this is basically a. Um, poor planning from the US side in terms of looking and asking the right kind of questions. Um, uh, yeah. but, uh, but if I were advising Xi Jinping, that's exactly what I would tell him. Yeah, I don't know how easy, would, how easy would it be to really create an economic blockade of Taiwan? Um, obviously, we can supply fuel. We can, you know, I mean, that's big exporter ourselves. Many other friendly countries are. Um, I, it, would, it, would, it would take it would take a lot of effort, right? It would take it would a lot of effort. That's why I said they'll do it, and maybe not now, but in a, a decade or two, when yeah. they really kind of created this right. economic uh, power base, which they are. You know, you've got literally mm-hmm. over fifty countries. Yeah, you can make countries do things you want, and yeah, like our like, system, you can't really make them do what you, you we want. Do we what we you can want. influence. We can. You can influence. Look at France, for example, didn't support the U.S. in the Iraq War. Yeah, I mean, still friends. That doesn't work with China. Yeah. Countries like Pakistan, for example, took sixty-two and a half billion dollars from China. They'll do exactly what the Chinese tell them to mm-hmm. do. You know, the building the Gwadar port in Pakistan is a Chinese base. Right. All of these countries, you know, Sri Lanka, Zambia, whatever, all got Chinese. They'll do exactly what the CC. This is economic colonization, yeah. much more effective. Yeah, um, we'll, we're coming close to end here. What a uh, going back to Russia, Ukraine, um, y'all have done some interesting work on this, and, and there's a couple of pieces of legislation here that we've been looking at and promoting, which is, okay, you want to pay for Ukraine reconstruction, pay for the war, uh, use Russian assets. There's yeah. like $350 billion frozen uh, dollars worth of, of frozen uh, Russian assets, and there are legal means to, to getting that and actually yeah. spending it, and therefore... Removing off the table the conversation mm-hmm. about whether we can afford this or not. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, we're at the maybe we, maybe we're not at the end of the war in Ukraine, but we're certainly at the beginning of the end. Mm-hmm. And the question is going to arise: you know, who's going to pay for all of this? And the damage that's been estimated, you know, the World Bank estimates is between three hundred forty-nine billion to over one trillion dollars. Mm-hmm. You know, so who should pay for this? You know, should it be the U.S. taxpayer, the British taxpayer, or the Europeans? You know, that's not a form of natural justice. The reality is that, that Russia should pay compensation to Ukraine. And this is, brings me back to my earlier point in terms of the international system not working. You know, Iraq paid Kuwait uh, $52 billion in reparations. And in fact, they only completed the last payment last year. That was the final payment that they did. But that was only after Iraq was defeated by an international coalition. It was occupied by the international coalition and it was mandated by the Security Council. Now, none of these three things are going to happen with Russia. It won't be defeated by a coalition. It won't be occupied. And the Security Council clearly will not mandate it with a Russian veto there. So how do you get Russia to pay? And the reality is that we have $350 billion worth of Russian state assets here in the United States. And the president does have the power to 
um, uh, use that. Um, so when I say use that, I have to be careful in the terminology there. We, this is not freezing the assets, because once you freeze something, you have taken ownership of it. The president has authority to transfer those assets into an escrow account. Mm. He did this with Iraq. He did this with Iran. There is precedent for this. And then those assets are then used by an independent agency. In this case, it could be the likes of the World Bank or something, then to pay reparations uh, to to Ukraine. Interesting. Do you think he has that authority even without Congress? Yeah, he um, has the authority. You know, so some the, of it's not in the U.S. I mean, it's, I thought a lot was in Belgium. I keep hearing a lot Belgium. of it is in Europe. A lot of it is in Europe. It, 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 it's a bit uh, vague in terms of where a lot of these assets are. But but the reality is, a lot of it is in the U.S. We know about three hundred fifty billion dollars are in the U.S. A lot of it is in other countries, and c- countries need to work together. You know, c- all the European, U.S. Uh, Japan all right. need to work together mm-hmm. and I tell you Dan this is not just a form of natural justice you know we were talking about Taiwan earlier you know if the most effective deterrent for the CCP and the Politburo and the Chinese investment in the US is exponentially larger than the US uh, uh, than the Russians if you send the signal that look hang on are you go and invo- getting involved in adventures in Taiwan those assets that you have in the West are going to be at risk and they could be personal assets i can guarantee you those around xi jinping the members of the Politburo. Yeah, there's a lot they, of chinese assets in they the think to, you know they've got apartment buildings in california and florida All they, over if, they, the if you tell them that look hang tons on, of real estate those those might be at risk i guarantee you that is probably the most effective deterrence when it's their personal wealth that comes into question so and, and this has to be done because the international system cannot deliver then yeah. the Security Council is no. not going to deliver. No. no, we have this situation, Dan. It's totally bizarre. A member of the Security Council, a nuclear power, has invaded its democratic neighbour. And another member of the Security Council, a nuclear power, is threatening to invade its democratic neighbour, Taiwan. Yeah. The system is not working. Uh, it hasn't worked for a long time. Yeah. It's it's a place where uh, delegates from each country can go talk. That, yeah. that's, that is the extent of the UN's utility. Yeah. Um, and I guess there's some utility to at least having a forum yeah, to no, go absolutely. talk. But once you know, again, as I there's said, no need, other reason yeah, for it. We need to have a, a, an alliance of democracies that kind of comes to these kinds of decisions. You know, Boris Johnson, uh, he, he uh, postulated the idea of having a D10, a democratic 10. So it could be informal. Uh, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be an agency, but mm. the fact is we need to work with our democratic allies. If we rely on just international agencies, they'll never deliver anything. No, no. And we shouldn't expect them to. Um, Dr. Ibrahim, thank you for uh, being on. It was, yeah, great conversation. Really interesting. Thanks so much for having uh, me. Yeah, appreciate it.